All right. Well, uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone to this edition of the Topeka Symphonies Behind the Baton. Uh, this is our monthly, more or less, broadcast where we talk about uh, the music, uh, the concert that's coming up. Uh, we don't normally do one for a Pops concert. We don't normally do them by Zoom either, but this year with the pandemic, we've been doing these as uh, as broadcasts instead of in-person. We look forward to when we can get back to in-person. Uh, my name is Kyle Wiley Pickett. I'm the music director and conductor for the Topeka Symphony, and I am joined today. Uh, I'm excited to introduce to you all uh, the Topeka Symphony's assistant conductor, Raffaele Cipriano. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Maestro, for inviting me today. Now, I, I I don't say your name as beautifully as you do. Why don't you tell us your name just so so we get the so everybody can hear the pronunciation correctly? Uh, it's it's Raffaele Cipriano. Okay, we're close. I was close. Yeah, very very close. No, I'm impressed. Yes. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, and many people probably don't know. Uh, we have an assistant conductor now, and I, I'm just really excited that uh, that you have been with us this year. And I'm, I'm even more excited because you're you're willing to stay on. And it's been so good to have you as an assistant conductor. Uh, you know, originally the idea was that, you know, with the pandemic, the possibility of of anybody in the orchestra, but myself, especially being um, having to quarantine, on a concert week would be pretty devastating. And so um, you and I worked together when I guest conducted at the University of Kansas. And so I reached out to you and and um, it's been great to have you as an assistant conductor, but your job became much bigger than that. And your job very suddenly became our broadcast director. And uh, so I've been so grateful. We'll talk a little bit about that, but can you just just tell us a little bit about um, about where you're from and your background oh, and how you ended up here? Sure, that's a, that's a fun long story. I mean, I studied in I'm from Italy and I studied uh, music in Italy in Padova and Venice, um, and then I realized that there are right now and when I graduated there were not a lot of jobs opportunities for young musicians. So I thought, okay, let's move to the U.S. There are good uh, doctorate program there, good, you know, colleges, a lot of theaters, universities, and some more opportunities. So I won my audition at KU, I, and it was a great place to study, great school of music. I started conducting with, um, with David Neely, great conductor and mentor. And, um, and, and where it's, there is where we met and uh, we had a few collaboration together. I was very happy to, to, you know, to have you as guest conductor there and assist you. And um, after graduating, you know, I've been sticking around here in the KC area um, as conductor of small production, community orchestras, and I'm the music director of a church here. And uh, it's been great to have this opportunity with Topeka Symphony and, uh, you know, stay with the professional, uh, you know, with the professional orchestra doing major repertoire and uh, behind the scene and in rehearsal and was, yeah, it was a great year. So, well, you know, um, a lot of people don't probably know what an assistant conductor really does. And, um, and the job is very, it's, it's, it's not an easy job to do because you have to be ready to go on. You know, if right. if I couldn't go on, you have to be ready to do the performance. So right. you have to be prepared just as though you were actually, you know, conducting the concert. And uh, and of course, many times um, you're taking notes for me out there. I, sure. I turn around, you know, regularly. Can you know because we're performing in TPAC, which you know is not our normal hall. Um, and so there have been a lot of things that I've had to learn about the hall. And of course, every yeah. concert has been different this year because our, our orchestra grew all year long. And so it's not like we had a standard setup that then we figured out. I mean, every every single concert has has had different dynamics. So you've been very helpful with that. I've put you on the podium to conduct in rehearsals when I come out and listen. Yeah. Um, you conducted in our holiday concert. Um, and uh, so all of those things are kind of standard assistant conductor duties and responsibilities. Right. But this year we started live streaming the concerts and boy, you know, <clears throat> We, we were so fortunate in the way this unfolded because the uh, 
learning how to live stream is it's very difficult it's a completely new uh, skill for us as an orchestra it's a challenge yes and so we have um we have a really marvelous um company that we're working with frank schultz uh, you know has been has, right. and stream a show has been fantastic and they have multi cameras and they have he has excellent technology but you know you can put a bunch of cameras on an orchestra and the camera can often be in the wrong place unless you have someone directing the broadcast right. you cannot expect the director or the camera the cameraman to be you know to know the score and to right. know where the soloist or the more you know the prominent instruments are are in that specific moment i mean they're great at their job they're not necessarily musicians so that's where kind of my, my my job came in and i i had to sit uh, next to the director on the same table he was operating his technology i was just with my score open right. following your performance and uh, pointing him okay there's a solos on the oboe coming up or now it's a big violin moment or now we are closing at the very end at the end or, or the start of the piece you don't yeah. want the camera to show a, a specific player but you want a broad um, angle or a conductor angle something that you know close up the the piece and so i would cue him okay it's about to, to end in 10 minutes uh, sorry in 10 seconds yeah get ready close and we're done and so now you you came up had you done this before I mean, you're, I you're at KU. Yes. I was say you're already pretty. You're pretty tech savvy uh, coming into this. You you had actually worked at KU with a broadcast. Right. Yes, because I was assistant there, so uh, it was important for the school of music when you know the orchestra is playing to frame the soloist to 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 make sure that all the players are seen because we had of course a lot of parents tuning in for the live streaming of the concert oh right and they want to see the, the you know the their kids performing and yeah. especially when there is some big solo so i was usually in the booth in the back of the theater with the director and my score and pointing them out so i was already doing a little bit of this so you had you had some experience which is amazing i mean because there aren't very many people who had that experience going already coming Correct. into this but I understand, I mean, talking to Frank and, and talking to you, you, you kind of came up with a system now after the first couple of concerts, didn't you, on how to map out the camera shots? Right. So basically, um, with the software that Frank is using, we can save uh, on the camera some presets, some angles. So before each concert, because every time the, the seating is a little bit rearranged on stage, yeah. but Frank and I go through the main soloist. So, uh, and we save the preset for the, you know, French horn, preset for the flute, for the oboe, preset for the concert master. And then we do some kind of mixed preset, preset for the woodwinds or preset for the low brass. I mean, that low brass are gonna be featured right. a lot in the Star Wars yeah. concert. Yeah, right. Preset for the percussion. And so, it's easier for me to communicate with him and telling him, uh, okay, uh, there is a big uh, timpani and trumpets. You know, let's go there, uh, get ready, and then here they are. And uh, with all these presets, you know, the, we don't have to chase the angle every time. We just, right. It's just a click. And it's been working very well. Well, I have to say, I've, I've had comments from people who have just been so impressed. Uh, people who, you know, listen in and, and watch um, who who have a lot of experience, you know, watching orchestras and they, they've just been so impressed with how professionally our broadcasts come together that they that, you know, the camera is not because, you know, even even when you're watching PBS, sometimes, you know, the, the cameras on the oboe when the cello is playing a solo or yes. you know, it, it yeah. happens because it's hard to follow the orchestra around. And especially, I mean, gosh, we've played we've played so we've played this year, Rite of Spring, we've played La Valse. Those, those pieces, the lines move through the orchestra at an enormously rapid rate, right? I mean, yeah. so how did you, well, you knew the scores. I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know the scores. I know the scores and I also know that we cannot catch everything. Yeah. I mean, with a piece like Rite of Spring or La Valse, uh, there's so much going on and a solo last, uh, you know, two bars, just three, four seconds, and then there's another one. There's not enough time for a director to 
switch from one camera to another because we don't want to give people watching a frantic switch, right. you know, every right. two seconds. We want, you know, the good experience to the transition to be smooth. So I had to kind of focus on the big moments, the most important solos. And, um, and sometimes when you watch some recording, some professional recordings, they they are done in post production. They have a bunch of cameras, <laughs> you know. They record all the possible angles, and then they decide, and they have quick, very quick transition. But we do everything live, so right. it's just you know it has to go with the concert and has to be done on the spot. So I I, I kind of mark my score with some you know sticky notes <laughs> about right. what I want because I know that that solo is important that moment is particularly meaningful and it's been it's been working well we, we had fun it's been growing every concert yeah uh, for yeah. us so I, i'm curious for you so obviously it, well i'm i, I want to point out another thing that you've been doing for us that that our audience has benefited from which is you've actually done a lot especially the last few concerts in adjusting the audio balance to get a really um as accurate as possible uh, a reflection of what it sounds like in in the hall and again you know we're we're blessed by the fact that you have skill in all of these different areas because um recording or um or or miking for an orchestra probably i i would say probably based on everything i've read and heard from sound engineers is the hardest thing to to mic for i mean just astronomically more difficult than like a rock band or a, or a Broadway show uh, because we have so many different acoustical instruments on the stage and they all, they each have different acoustical characteristics, right? I mean, right. you know, woodwinds put out their sound in a 360 degree ball and it tends to come from the end, like a flute, it comes, the sound is mostly emitting from the end of the keys and the head joint, right? Whereas right. a trumpet or a trombone, they're putting out a cone of sound and the strings, you know, who knows what a violin does, right? I mean, actually, I mean, we do know it reflects down from the bottom of the instrument and up from the top of the instrument. So it's kind of putting out two cones that make sort of a ball. Right. Um, so all of the instruments are doing different things and, um, and miking that is very difficult. And then making a sound that sounds like the, um, what the audience hears is extremely difficult. So the last few concerts in, in our dress rehearsals, um, you've been assisting our sound engineer on the board with with adjusting the balance. So how does that work for you? I mean, how is how is that? Ex what do you do to prepare for that? So uh, I come there that the microphones are already set up and connected to the soundboard, so that taken care of, and that's great. And uh, I think it was the right decision not to put too many mics because mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it's a challenge with the orchestra. It's a real challenge, but it's also a blessing that you cannot control every single instrument. Like on a concert Broadway show, you don't have a single microphone. Uh, I'm so, going to interrupt you for just a moment because we'll come back. But you know, um, Herbert von Karajan, who conducted the Berlin Philharmonic, you know, the right. Berlin Philharmonic was closely tied to Deutsche Grammophon and they, the Deutsche Grammophon label recorded. And I, I know from reading some of the histories, they put a mic on every single instrument and then afterwards, you know, Karyon would go into the booth, they recorded, they tracked every single instrument, and then Karyon would go into the booth and spend, you know, days and he'd say, okay, flute a little louder now. I mean, he was conducting it again from the booth, to, you know, and, um, and those recordings are just astonishingly good recordings, but I feel like there is a little bit of an artificial sense with them. And then, and then later, Telarc, you know, the Telarc label, which did so much with the Atlanta Symphony, they went the other direction. They just put a, a stereo pair out in the hall, saying, "Okay, this is this is the sound that comes out into the hall. We're going to do that." But they built a box, a wooden box that covered all of the seats in the hall, so that they didn't have the cloth seats absorbing the sound. So, I, and of course, we can't do any of that because we're right. doing a live concert. And right. so, like you said, this is not a recording session. You know, it's not a video recording session. It's not an audio recording session. So, so go back to back to what you were saying about how well, to balance the compromise, it. The compromise is to have uh, uh, several mic microphones. And I think we ended up with nine at the last concert. Um, usually, 
uh, in pairs. So because we want always a kind of a stereo sound having something different from the right and the left. So we have two uh, mics in front in front of you. I mean, on, on the, at the conductor yeah. uh, spots that brings mainly the strings and the first, uh, I mean, the, the first woodwinds. Uh, then we have two microphones hanging from the from the ceiling. We have two microphones left and right always from the lodge. And for the back row of the brass, uh, we started with two mics, one for low brass and one for trumpets and, and horns. And now we ended up with three. So we have a left, center and right for yeah. the back row. Um, and this captures uh, kind of all of the sound of the orchestra and then becomes a matter of mixing what what we want because um of course the the every every section should be heard but not overpowered the other section right and so that's kind of a fine tuning at the board with the levels uh and now you're not doing a live mix so it's not like you're playing we're playing along and you say oh the brass are too loud i'm going to bring them down i mean you set what the orchestra right. you set what our sound is going to be like and then the the people in stream are hearing a pretty accurate sound of what it sounds like in the hall right i mean from loud to soft and it's, yes they definitely hear we are not touching anything during the show yeah we want to come out with a good general mix and yeah. without doing any tweaking because it would sound a little bit artificial yeah. And it's another layer or complexity that we, <laughs> we probably don't yeah. want. Well, and then this is an interesting, you know, I mean, on, really only another conductor knows that, you know, people will often say to me, oh, you're the conductor, you get the best, you get the best sound in the house. And the truth is, that's rarely the case. I mean, the sound of a hall is meant to sound good where the audience is, not where the conductor is standing, right? And so there are times when I will say to you, are you hearing the bassoon? And you say, I hear it fine. And I, I wow. can't really hear it. And because it's going right over my head, you know, going out into the hall. And so, um, you know, it's, it's making the adjustments that, you know, in the beginning of this, when I said, you know, we haven't played in this hall enough. I mean, we now have played in this hall enough to really know it. But, you know, in the early days, I'd have to say, OK, Raffaele, do I hear are you hearing clarinets? So I have to make an, a mental adjustment. If I hear clarinets, let's say at 40 percent of what I want to hear, that's the sound that's right into the hall. So I, I don't want to tell them to play louder so that I can hear them at the correct right. balance. I want it to be the correct balance out there in the hall. Right. And so um, it's in some ways, it's the same when you're setting up the balances for the recording. Right. I mean, because you don't want the brass to overwhelm the sound of the orchestra. So that level might have to be lower than the strings, but that doesn't mean that we're artificially fixing it. It's it's just know. the balance. We're balancing and it's hard. Um, I mean, we don't really, we don't really achieve the sound that people would get from the, from the hole. Right. Because when you are in the hole, you hear a, a massive sound coming from the stage blended and beautiful and coming to your to your ears. Yeah. With our recordings, it's like you are sitting in the in kind of in the in the front row, in the really front. Yeah. Of, so because you can hear the violin on the on the left, then the violas, the uh, the, the seconds, the violas, and the cello basses on your right. Right. You have a, a spectrum. You have yeah. you know the trumpets are on the left and the uh, tuba low brass are on the right yeah um it's we are kind of treating that as an hi-fi um the record. sound the sound stage so the sound yes yeah so you have you can actually especially hear the 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 instruments in different places and that helps because even if the blend is there and they're blended but you know, there the flute is here, the oboe is here, and you can kind of picture your right, your left and right audio spectrum while you right. listen. And that that's my uh, that's my goal. Yeah. If so, if people listen with headphones or with a good pair of speakers, they should have a nice hi-fi right uh, sound. Which I think we definitely have. And and but that also brings up another point, which is something that I used to talk about a lot more, which is when you hear a recording you're really hearing a two dimensional representation of the sound. Whereas when you're in the live hall, you get a three dimensional, the sound surrounds you. It comes right. from, and which is different than when we talk about surround sound that a stereo can do. I mean, this is where 
the hall becomes an instrument of right. of the orchestra or or a um, complementary instrument because the hall itself resonates in different right. ways and so uh, you know if we're at white concert hall which is a wonderful acoustical space it resonates very differently than tpac which is also uh, quite a good space it's not a it's i mean it, we have found ways to make that space really work well for the orchestra um, i'll bring up one other thing because this is kind of interesting we had was it three concerts where we couldn't have an audience? Two or three concerts, I can't remember now. Three for sure. Three yeah, for three sure. for sure. Where we couldn't have an audience, where we did a live broadcast to an empty hall, which was so strange for us as performers. I mean, it, it's surreal to, you know, to be only going to the cameras and not have any audience response. It, it, it definitely demonstrated to us how important the audience is for our performances. But um, we did do something a little bit different in those performances than we do for the ones where we have audience and the live stream. Because for instance, when we had Iman play the, the Elgar cello concerto, um, you, we put a mic close to him, right? Right. And, right. and it's always a challenge to balance the orchestra to the soloist when, when we were doing a concerto always. And, and a cello, perhaps most of all, maybe, I mean, if, if you do a viola concerto, which we don't do very often, that might be even harder, but cello concertos are very hard to balance. Uh, and so because we didn't have any audience in the hall, this is one time where uh, you and I talked and we said, you know what, we're not going to worry about what it sounds like in the hall because it's only going out over the the broadcast the broadcast yes and so we're going to balance it at the mixing board so, right. so we cheated a little bit on that one right yeah but i mean there was nobody in the hall to actually you know tell a difference so we we focus for our audience of that night I think right. right that's right our audience on that night was only online right. and so that in that case it made sense to um to up his mic and and so right. his balance with the orchestra was more in line with what actually our audience expects from a recording because when right. you hear a record when you hear Jacqueline Dupre play the Elgar cello concerto that mic is jacked way up on the recording and you hear her like she is the front and center of everything and the orchestra you know is in and out as it needs to be live concerts not like that right you know um so anyway that I thought that just might be interesting for people to 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 know well I'm so grateful that we've had you for this year. I don't know what we would have done, to be honest, well, without you. So I, I, I was happy to, to collaborate. And yeah. it was a great experience. So really let's fun. let's talk for a few minutes about Star Wars. Oh, wow. because, because this concert, this is our final Pops concert of the year. And this is all music from the Star Wars. And we're keeping it in, in let's say, the, the canon. So we're talking about, you know, the, the original three... Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, the prequels, and then the ones that came, you know, in the last few years. So right. episodes seven, eight, and and nine here. Um, we're not doing Solo, and we're not doing Rogue One. And, and I will say to the chagrin of my son, who thinks Rogue One is the best Star Wars movie and and loves that score, and and I would, you know, someday we'll get that score and do it. Um, but uh, but we're doing Star Wars, and so I I just have to point out you've got a little friend watching us here. You've, well, this, of course, I this, have master. We have master Yoda. Good old Yoda. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's perfectly yeah. appropriate, I think, for, for always this. here in my in my bookshelf. You know, kind of keeping an eye on what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. So I know you're excited about this, and yeah. and I'm excited about this, and um, I I'm gonna say that I think John Williams scores for Star Wars. I think even now, but in the future, we're going to look at these as some of the greatest orchestral music of the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. Yeah. I, I mean, these are these are masterpieces of orchestral writing. And, um, you know, you you might argue that had there been films 200 years ago, Beethoven could have been writing film scores. Sure. So these these pieces, um, I'm I'm a little I'm older than you, but but I assume you grew up on Star Wars. I, I did, I did, and I grew up on Star Wars, and so um, I don't know about you, but for me, 
the first time I got the chance to conduct Star Wars, I mean, the Star Wars was some of the orchestral music that was most present in my head from a child, you know. I, I mean, I for me, is Star Wars and Petrushka and Appalachian Spring. I mean, those those wow. three wow. were kind of the three pieces, three things that it was just those I want to conduct those those pieces. Um, so tell me about I mean, so growing up in Italy is Star Wars is is it as big a thing as it is here? Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it is it is big and there are a lot of fans. And I remember I was little and my cousin uh who's older than me uh he introduced me to the to the first you know the episode four yeah i was just hooked up by the story and by the music i mean it's yeah. the music i mean the, i think that that the oldest star wars movie take another level with when you add the music you know, if you took away that uh, it's, there would be something missing yeah and so i remember loving the plot loving the you know this this Jedi Knights thing and uh, you know the rebels against the evil empire. I mean, yeah, you you can read it at different levels. You know, you, yeah. you look at that when you are a child, you have a certain vision. When you grow up, you can add more, you know, and relate to more things. Um, but the soundtrack is something that you never forget. I mean, this just all the brass and and. Uh, and the strings. What I love about John Williams is that not only, as you said, it's a masterpiece of orchestration and of of, of you know of score writing, yeah. but also the melodies, the themes are. Um, I mean, it's they they are simple and elegant, and they uh, connect to that character to that situation very easily. And you just need three notes. And you know which character is coming up, what's happening, and you are back in that theme. Yes. While sometimes you hear some Hollywood soundtrack, massive orchestration, good effect, and then after two hours movie, you you go home and you don't have a theme. Can't remember it. Hey okay, guys, so what's yeah. happening here? I I think that's true with like the Marvel movies these days. They're they're massive yeah. soundtracks. They've got they've got great orchestration. Um, they create great mood, but they don't have the memorable themes. Just just like you said. And, you know, from a musical technical standpoint, I think very much what John Williams is doing is in the vein of, of Richard Wagner of with course, the idea yeah. of, of the leitmotif for the leading motive. And, and I mean, I'm not unique in saying this. I think we all know that he's doing that. You, there are wonderful mapped out, uh, people have made web pages where they map out all the various themes. And, you know, we've got the Luke theme and the Leia theme and there's the Darth Vader theme, but there's also the force theme and there's the, the love theme. And so it's not just characters, but it's also psychological ideas. It's, uh, uh, it's scenarios. And sometimes, again, like Wagner, the music gives us clues before the story unfolds. Uh, right. I mean, it's, it's incredibly sophisticated. Yes. Um, so when I was a kid, you know, my my kids, I have two boys, they love Star Wars. They've always loved Star Wars. Um, and, you know, they've watched them over and over and over again. And, you know, they don't know a time when you can't watch these movies on demand anytime you want, right? They can, you know, the, can we go watch Rogue One? Sure, they could go watch Rogue One. But, you know, when I was a kid, even more than when you were a kid, when the Star Wars movies came out, they were not then released on video for quite a long time. He, oh. um, John, uh, I mean, sorry, George Lucas didn't allow them to be released for, for rental. Um, and so you had to wait until they did, I remember they did a, a network TV broadcast of Star Wars. And of course I'd seen it in the theater several times and then you waited and, and we watched, you know, they did a, uh, how they do the uh, the effects of Star Wars. And so you'd watch that just to get the, the chance to see some more. And so for me and my friends, you know, we had the, the toys, we had the Star Wars figures and, and to to relive the movie, the only way to do that was with the soundtrack. And so, you know, I remember my friend and I, my friend Greg Hayes and I, we, we wore out the LP of the Star Wars soundtrack. And yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. The London Symphony and, and John Williams conducting. And so you would listen to that in order to um, to think about the story that, that was going on. Right. And um, and my kids have done something similar, only they do it with Spotify playlists. So they put together, you know, a Spotify playlist of their favorite Star Wars music, and then they would run it on repeat. And you'd, you'd hear the, 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 the pieces over and over again. There are um, John Williams 
like you said, has a great gift for melody. Right. Um, he's got a great gift for leitmotif. Um, he does borrow styles from other composers, right? I mean, yeah. talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've got Holst, of course. Holst, for sure. Holst because, for sure. you know, and, and it makes sense because the planets, right? Right. There's definitely Mahler, right? Because of the right. way the horns. Um, there's Wagner because of the, the operatic leitmotif. Um, but I, I saw an interview, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with George Lucas, <coughs> where he, um, he put placeholder music in. So in the original Star Wars, the Tatooine scene, you know, where you've got the two sons, the two sons. Yeah. So George Lucas, um, put a placeholder from the Rite of Spring in there. And it's the dee da dee da, you know, it's the beginning of the second half of the Rite of Spring, which we know very well because we spent so much time on that this year. And so he put that in as a placeholder and he said to John Williams, he said, I want something that sounds like this. And, right. and so when you listen to the Tatooine theme, you say, oh, it's, it sounds like the Rite of Spring. Well, it sounds like the Rite of Spring because George Lucas asked him to write something that sounded like the Rite of Spring there. So it, it's not that he was necessarily stealing from other composers. You know, there was, there was purposeful connection right and you know borrowing has been done in music for you know for centuries borrowing has been done for centuries i think you know again you're probably too young to remember this but you know in the in the late 80s you know after the three original star wars films were done and before we got to the prequels right um you know john williams music was popular but i think in the music world he was looked down on there was kind of a sense oh it's just film music or it's a little derivative because he borrows from other composers and i think personally i think that that that's changed a lot in the next 25 years people have recognized the greatness of this i don't know I mean, what do you think about that i um, well, as you said, I was probably young to see the, the transition. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I, I can I can definitely recognize that in the past probably 10, 15 years, uh, his music has been performed in the you know in the most uh, important venues with the most you know uh, Vienna Philharmonic and their summer concerts. Yeah, you know. You know. And yes. And I, I mean, you know, that major actors perform him. Yeah. So. I think we, we have passed that that yeah. phase of looking him down eventually. Yeah. So it's good. Let's talk a little bit. So, you know, I'll, we get a lot of requests to play movie music and we do play movie music, but there are some challenges to orchestras playing film music. And the biggest challenge is getting our hands on it, right? I mean, if we want to do a Beethoven symphony, it's easy. We, can, we have the Beethoven symphonies in our library or we can get it or, you know, if you want to do, let's say a more obscure film score, like, Patrick Doyle's film score for Henry V, the Kenneth Branagh, which I've done. I had to search that piece. I mean, it took like a year of searching to figure out where to get it. And then you have to get in touch with a movie studio. And then they they aren't really in, they're in the business of making movies. They're not in the business of getting the orchestra parts to, to orchestras. And then you ask how much and they say, oh, I don't know, how about $10,000? And you say, $10,000, that's that's ridiculous. But they're, they're thinking, the range, totally. yeah. how about $500? And they say, okay, yeah, I mean, you know, but John Williams, he's a conductor, right? I mean, he's a conductor as well as, as a composer. He conducted the Boston Pops. So right. he knows how this works. And so John Williams has published almost all of his scores. And they're not just in arrangements. They're not like high school, you know, band or orchestra arrangements. These are called the, the John Williams Signature Edition. They are professional, um, professional publications. And they are note for note what's in the, the movie which is another reason that it makes them so exciting to play because you're not just getting a version of the film score, you're getting every note that they played in there. Yes. And, and he's savvy because, so here's Star Wars. Here's okay. The Force Awakens. This is a couple years ago, people said, hey, there's music from the original Star Wars that we want to do, like the Cantina Band and the Ewoks, and, and we don't have that. So they came out with music from the Star Wars saga. Here's, here's Revenge of the Sith. Here's 
um, you know, Phantom Menace. No, this one's Attack of the Clothes. Phantom Menace is on the floor. So part of the reason why we're able to do a concert like this is because he's made this music accessible to us, well, yeah. which is really exciting. And it's not cheap. But on the other hand, he lets you buy it. So for a lot of film scores, oh gosh, like I, I've done the Danny Elfman original Batman and they charge you like, you know, more than a thousand dollars for one performance. And that's a five minute long piece. And uh, here, you know, John Williams, he charges, you know, six, $700 to buy these. But then once you own them, you own them forever and you can play them as many times as you want. And so it may cost us a lot to buy these over time, but they're, they're the kind of parts that are worth having in the orchestra. Right. Yeah. So, all right, I'm sure we've run ourselves over, um, which is okay because this is for, for, for broadcast anyway, but yeah. uh, anything you wanna add as we finish up here? Uh, no, I'm very excited about this uh, upcoming concert. I mean, seeing, I have to say, it's. I was kind of joking in my head that this probably is kind of the top of my my musical career, so conducting Star Wars. You I know, know. Seeing, seeing an orchestra conducting, uh, seeing orchestra performing Star Wars live and assisting that, and uh, it's it's kind of a dream come true, and uh, because it's one of the orchestra pieces that I'm more fond of. So I, yeah. I I really can wait. I can wait to start. You know. I've started looking at the score, put some marks for the cameras and having the orchestration there. And then as you can see yeah. the choice that the composer made for that sound for that moment. It's just, just great. It's exciting stuff. Well, Raffaele, thank you. I mean, we're so grateful to have you with us all year. I'm so grateful you're continuing on with the Topeka Symphony. And thanks for, uh, thanks, for thanks for joining me today to do this. And sure. I think, you know, if people get through the end of our whole conversation, I think there's a lot we've we've talked about here. Yeah. And uh, so so thanks so much uh, for joining us for Behind the Baton. And thank you all for watching. And we look forward to seeing you live and in person or on the live stream for the Star Wars concert. Um, Raphael, why don't you stay on for a couple minutes here and we're going to I'll stop the broadcast and and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you at the Topeka Symphony. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.